Welcome back to another episode of the Sports Glory podcast all about sports and fitness. Today we have with us the Indian squash star Ramitan with us. He is currently fourth here in our country and has a world rank of about 52 and has a world series rank of 40. He turned pro at the end of 2017 as one four PSA title since then. He's also a bronze medalist of Asian Games and has One hell out of medals for India. So I want to thank you again for coming and joining up in your busy schedule to the Sports Glory podcast. Thanks a lot for coming up. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's an honor to be on this show. Um, as I told you earlier, I've I've uh, watched a couple of episodes and I kind of really enjoyed it, and uh, I'm really happy to be part of this. So thank you. I am happy that you are happy hearing to my podcast. That sounds surprising. Thanks a lot for that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, like to begin with, I want to ask you about like your whole journey. Long story short, how did you get into start the squash, and then in that lineup you are representing our country now. So, how did that journey go? Well, the journey has been has been fun. Um, it's been a lot of learning. Okay. Uh, at the same time a lot of emotion uh, like any other athlete's journey right a lot of ups and downs and um, i think uh, uh, if you spend time in the sport um, or or something apart from like um, work or something that you're really emotionally attached to which is usually like a sport or music or, or a kind of passion of yours you tend to feel both the ups and the downs in looking more than you do with other things in normal life so so the journey has been similar in terms of when i started i started at the age of um, six, 6 or 7 and um, yeah it was it's, it's always been a very natural process uh, as a kid my parents always encouraged me to play sport so i was um, taking classes in cricket i mean as an indian uh, you cannot not play cricket right yeah. so uh, that was a must so i did some cricket i did a bit of swimming and my dad actually used to play squash um, in calcutta okay I won the clubs and as every other kid um my dad is my hero and I really look up to him and uh, as a kid I, I wanted to follow him and, and do what he does and that's where I started uh, playing squash I would follow him to the club watch him play try to copy and and play like him and slowly I said me that hobby turned into a passion where like from once or twice a week I started going three or four times and then I started skipping cricket lessons and swimming lessons and it was just squash and and since then there's been no looking back um and things have just fallen in, into place step by step play by play <laughs> that that is sounding like a very progressive career like from starting up from scratch and then step by step and then you made it now I I don't think I don't look at it as a career that's, that's okay. the funny part um, okay I I <laughs> it has never been any decision making mm-hmm. it's never been uh, i think when you when people talk about a career it's like you sitting down and and consciously thinking about something mm-hmm. and say okay this is what i want to do and making some tough decisions in a room that's that's how like when you think of the word career it okay. brings a very serious part <laughs> to your head uh, squash has not been that way for me i've never actually had to sit down and and say i want to do this it just came okay. naturally like it, it just fell into place and this is something i wanted to do and i would go do it and it would hopefully go well or badly and you would move on and you would learn from it but um but yeah so so now when people when i look look when people tell me about it being a career and, I, and when did i make this decision and stuff i never <laughs> never made a decision it just um, it just happened so, okay yeah. that's all interesting so like, can you remember the, like the first time that you ever won up your first international medal for india So the first time would probably be in the juniors. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was eight, I think, when I won the Malaysian Junior Open boys under eleven. Uh, it was many, many years ago, so I can't really remember it okay. as busy <laughs> as I would like to. But uh, uh, but I, I remember I did sleep the night before the final because okay. I was very, very excited to play like my first international uh, tournament final, and I was very excited. I was up, I think, since four a.m. Um, okay. And I don't think I played very well that day. But okay. I just managed to win. Uh so I remember that. Uh but yeah, so I think that was my first uh, international tournament title. Okay, that's cool. So like as you grew up, how did you manage your sports as well as your uh, education? 
Yep. Uh, it was hard. Okay. And it was challenging. Uh, I would lie if I said that uh, <laughs> it's easy and it was a walk in the park. It wasn't. But um, I mean, the truth is, like, I get credit for it. But, but the honest truth is that um, I actually have worked hard, but I haven't. It, it's like I alone would not be able to balance it. Yep. I've been very fortunate to be surrounded by uh, people who have been very helpful, whether it's been my parents who have been very supportive and have really helped me balance my sport and education or my coaches uh, and my teachers. And I think it's been their support that has taken a bit of the load off me. And, um, and yeah, without any of them, I don't think I would have been able to kind of create the balance and, uh, and they actually deserve the credit, you know, because if I didn't really have to think about anything, but what I was doing in that moment, you know, so if I was studying, everything else was taken care of. So I didn't really have to think of squash or, or physiotherapy or anything else. Like it was all covered by someone or the other. And I would just focus on what I was doing. And then I was playing squash. I didn't really have to focus about my calculus uh, <laughs> problem set or my history class or something. Uh, so, so yeah, so they took a lot of stress off me and, um, without this support, uh, it, it wouldn't have been possible. So that, that is the truth, but, uh, I get a lot of credit for it. So <laughs> sometimes I just take it. I, I just feel like, uh, I just work very hard, but no, that, that's, that's not true. Um, so yeah, just, I think a lot of uh, fortune has been, uh, I mean, God has been kind. A lot of, uh, um, people that we have been throughout my, uh, my career and even do now so yeah been fortunate that way okay so like as you told about calculus i kind of remembered like how bullshit i was ma- i was in max and i was in 12th so i just remember all those stuff now yeah <laughs> yeah it's scary at times you know yeah. we, we all go through that uh, <laughs> especially calculus. the reason i mentioned yeah. it now because i, I still remember uh, it's a very scary thought <laughs> it is <laughs> So, like, how has been your experience playing in big tournaments like Commonwealth Games and Asian Games? Oh, well, it's been a dream come true, I think, for every athlete, mm-hmm. uh, apart from cricketers, because cricket, yep. um, I feel the World Cup that. is the biggest. <laughs> but um, no, I, I think it's amazing. The World Cup is amazing. Cricket is good vision, and yes, yep. I don't think you should feel <laughs> bad. Uh, bad for the sport, but uh, but uh, for other sports apart from cricket. Maybe a couple of other other sports, but uh, uh, a multi-sporting event like the Asians and the Commonwealth Games um, are, are amongst the biggest. And for squash, since a sport in the Olympics, the Asians is the biggest sport by the Commonwealth Games. Uh, so it was definitely a to, to participate, uh, represent India, and then win the medal in the Asians was uh, was truly amazing. And I, I think uh, the atmosphere is very different when you're in a sporting village. Surrounded by athletes from different sports, you, you tend to learn a lot, you make a lot of friends, and you also get this uh, spirit, uh, like a patriotic spirit, because mm-hmm. you're one big team and you're supporting yeah. each other. And, and so it's, it's a good feeling to rub shoulders with some of the best athletes in the world, some of the best athletes in your country. And, um, uh, and yeah, I mean, uh, one of the proudest moments has been um, standing on the podium with the medal with the national anthem playing in the background. So that's something that. Uh, I hold on to for the rest of my life. Yeah, that is like one of the goosebump moment for all the athletes out there. Yeah. So, like, how does your typical training day look like? Like, what kind of training do you do? Like, how many sessions? I mean, it varies. Um, as you play sport, you will understand it um, a little better than um, most other people mm-hmm. do. I think we go through different programs depending on how far away you are from your matches and how far away you are from the season. And of course, as you come closer to competition, you kind of reduce the workload a little bit. Um, in between competitions, the workload uh, changes. But on a basic plan, I would probably have um, three sessions a day, two squash sessions, one fitness session, and then I would have one flexibility and the um, physiotherapy session, which is which I count as a recovery session. Okay. So yeah, three to four sessions a day. Uh, I normally split it up. I do one in the morning. I do one late in the evening. And I do one in the afternoon, in between the morning and the evening. And normally the recovery session I do at night. Uh, sometimes I do it in the morning. So it, okay. so it depends, yeah. Okay. 
So like all throughout your journey, how has been your family support? Because I believe without family support, you can't just come so far away in sports. I think as I said in the beginning, the sport is, is a very emotional journey. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you, you do really feel your losses and you enjoy your wins as well. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you have to have a lot of emotional and, and mental support as well as you go through this journey because we all see as athletes some really difficult times. Um, it, it's, it's a very cutthroat profession because, you know, in, in most other professions, when you're working at a job or something, you don't see the results as mm-hmm. quickly as you do in sport. You know, like when you get an assignment, you work on a project for a few months and then you eventually make a profit or a loss and, and that's where you find out that you're winning or losing, right? In sport, in match, you win or lose. So you, you see the result right away. So, so you tend to deal with success and failure more often than some other people in other lines of work. So that definitely requires a bit more emotional strength and mental strength. And, uh, and I think that's where family plays a big part. Mm-hmm. Um, firstly, understanding what you go through um, and at the same time encouraging you and making sure you don't feel the pressure. So, uh, so yeah, I think uh, they, they play a massive role um, in my life and of course in every athlete's mm-hmm. life. I, I would believe it, they are an important aspect. And apart from that, I, I believe family plays a big role, but even apart from that, coaches and, and people surrounding you, uh, because you as an athlete, uh, pursue a sport mm-hmm. because it's your passion and you want to do it but there are a lot of other people around you who also go through the same pain because uh, they are part of your team right and the one thing and they're just supporting you so so there are a lot of people like behind the scenes who play a very important role who who do uh, they are an integral part of an athlete's mm-hmm. uh, success or failure that's true that's say. true <laughs> So, like, who has been one of the toughest competitors so far in your squash journey? Uh, I mean, see, different phases in life, I've had different competitors. Uh, I mean, different competitors in India, different competitors in Asia, different competitors um, at the world stage. Um, so, it changes throughout. I don't think I've had one uh, okay. specific competitor. Um mostly if, if I can name a country it would be the Egyptians mm-hmm. uh, they have been dominating squash for a few yeah. years now and um, and yeah so, so so they have been our biggest competition um, and yeah so we enjoy the challenge yeah that's true so like uh, whom do you train under now like who like who's your coach now and like where do you train now so my coach is Hisham Mehta. He's my squash coach, and okay. he's actually from Egypt, but based in uh, in the US. So mostly, so so he's the head coach, and then I have a fitness coach uh, who's from India. His name is Anwar Wahab. Uh, so these two are the two integral part uh, of my coaching. One looks after the the squash, and he Hisha basically designs the program, and Anwar looks after the fitness part. Um, mostly, I train um, in the New York area. Okay. Uh, but of course, since uh, the cold and the lockdown and stuff, I have been back home. And uh, thanks to technology, we have been coordinating uh, over Zoom and over the phone, yeah. and, and we are finding ways to to keep it going. But uh, but yeah. Okay. So, like, what are the tournaments that that are lining up for you in in a couple of months or some some way down this year? Lining up. Yes. So we start uh, next month uh, in Qatar. It's mm-hmm. called the Qatar Classic. Okay. Um, that's the only one that's been confirmed. After that, if I'm not wrong, I think the next event is in Egypt. Okay. Which is in December. And followed by that December, the next one is in England. But of course, the schedule is very tentative right now. Qatar has been confirmed. Okay. Uh, but Egypt and England is still, still um, it's, it's, they've planned it, but it's not confirmed yet. But if things go well, then we're expecting to have those two events in December. But uh, of course, it depends on how Qatar plays out and, and on the world scenario mm-hmm. by, yeah. by December, if things are getting better or worse. And, and then our uh, organization is going to take a call. Hopefully all goes fine. And I want to wish you like a very big all the best from my side. Hope you bring a lot of medals and reach flying heights soon for India. 
Thank you so, so much. Uh, I'll definitely try my best. Yep. Um, so like, you know, like I recently saw your TEDx talks. Like how has been your uh, experience of talking in big platforms like TEDx? I mean, the, the reason I did it actually, I'm, I've been very, very afraid to speak publicly. Okay. And I had the problem all throughout college. Okay. Where whenever I had to do big classes, like when, when we had big classes and I was supposed to present or something, I would get really nervous and, and scared. Okay. Uh, so when, when they reached out to me, I actually really didn't want to do it. <laughs> but for some reason, there was something in me that said, well, this is my opportunity to, to get over the fear because I've graduated college. So I'm not going to get the chance to talk in front of other students. So I was like, well, I don't know where I'm going to get the opportunity to actually get over the fear. Public speaking is something I used to be really, really scared of. Uh, so I kind of forced myself into doing it. Um, and, uh, and yeah, like I was a little nervous, but I think um, I was just better prepared this time because this time I knew I was, on, the, on previous occasions what happened was I didn't think I would get nervous. But then once I did get nervous, I, was, I wasn't prepared. I didn't have like a backup plan. Okay. But here I was prepared. I knew I'm going to get nervous. So, so I was ready for it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so so I think somewhere during the talk, I kind of opened up a little bit. Um, and since then, public speaking has been going fine for me. So I think the uh, the trick worked. So I would like to tell everyone, like when people say uh, the best way to get, o- get over fear is by, by forcing yourself to do mm-hmm. it. It's kind of true. So if you're really afraid of something, just do it. And once you do it, that's it. It changes for the rest of your life. So yeah, so since then, I've been fine. Uh, to speak publicly and not as shy as I used to be. That's great. But in between, like, I kind of loved your talk. The way you actually shared all your thoughts and then the way you delivered it, I loved it. No, thank you. I think you're just being kind because I agreed to do your podcast. You're being really <laughs> no, nice no, to no, me. No, 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 not that, not okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. So, yeah. So, like, we're almost at the end of this first session. Like, the last question I want to ask you is, where can we see Ramutan on in next five years? Where can we see me in the next five years? Mm-hmm. That's actually a, a difficult question for me to answer because okay. I don't look at things too far away. Okay. Um, I don't um, plan things too far away. I, I, I get very focused on what I have coming up next. And okay. then once I'm done with that, I get focused on what I have coming up next. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, five years from now, who knows? <laughs> okay. Hope you are like you. You are like somewhere in a big position in big in in like developing the whole squash question in there. Yep. Yeah, if you pray hard enough for that, and if all your viewers do pray hard enough for that, maybe <laughs> I will I will make it there. Yeah, I'll ask them too. <laughs> yeah, this question yeah. actually popped up to me now. We see like after a lot of applications even being sent, squash was ejected from uh, Tokyo 2021. So do you think anywhere in the line, squash has a potential to be a part of Olympics? Well, I personally believe squash should be in the Olympics mm-hmm. uh, as a sport because some of the sports that are in the Olympics aren't as, uh, like, people say squash is not a popular sport, but uh, the reason I think it should be in the Olympics is because the Olympics does have a lot of sports that, that is in mainstream sports. You mm-hmm. know, All sports in the Olympics aren't as popular as tennis. There are still some sports that are like rafting and then some sports, which sometimes I turn on the TV and I've been like, I've never seen the sport yeah. before, right? So, so when it comes to popularity, I don't feel that is a big issue why squash is not in the Olympics. Um, apart from that, I think um, as a sport, you know, I, I, I think there are a lot of areas that we could improve on. Uh, okay. we, we have grown as a sport mm-hmm. over the years. If, if you see where squash was 10 years down the line versus where it's today, we have come a long way. And I think we, we are getting too carried away by, by the Olympics. Um, I think if we just keep growing as a sport, someday we'll make it there. But uh, we, we shouldn't really get distracted by just focusing on the Olympics and our yeah. sport should just grow and get better in different ways. And I think that's how I look at it. And that's how I think, um, uh, I, I mean, it's not going to change my decision of whether I want to play the sport or not. I play it because I love it. I mean, of course, Olympics would be huge for the sport yeah. and do get the business behind it and the Olympics being the Olympics. But at the same time, I don't think it's make or break for me to, to play a sport. I think to play any sport, you've got to love the game. Yeah. And if you love the game, then it, it does not really matter if it's in the Olympics or not. You will play it because of the love for the game. So personally, it does not change a lot in terms of how I would approach the sport. 
Um, and in terms of getting into the Olympics, I would just say like we've tried and we haven't made it. And I think the reason we didn't make it was because we just focused too much on on making it into the Olympics. You know, instead yeah. of just focusing on growing that sport and then just sliding into the Olympics. So, so I think instead of now looking back at that as if we lost out on something, we should just keep improving our sport and not worry about it. And then someday we are, we are going to make it. I, I do believe someday squash will make it. So I don't think uh, okay. it's too much to, to worry about. Yeah. So like after talking with you, I kind of feel like you are a super optimistic person. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you got to be right. Uh, <laughs> if you play a sport, <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. I think, I think, yeah. I, I like uh, being positive about things. Um, okay. I like uh, believing in things, believing that things will go well and they will go the way I want them to go. Because if I don't have the belief, then it's definitely not going to go the way I want it to go. So by having the belief, at least I'm giving myself the chance of having things go the way I want yeah. it to go. So yeah. That's totally okay. right. So, like, let's get into the second uh, session. It's called Rapid Fire. You've got to answer this very quickly. Okay, it's going to be super fun. Okay. <laughs> uh, your dream okay. destination? Fun for you. <laughs> uh, New York. Yeah. Sunrise or sunset? Sunset. Okay. Sunrise is stuff to wake up for. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Strength training or cardio training? Strength. Okay. Hill run or beach run? Beach. Beach is slightly easier than hill sprints. Hill okay. is too hard on the hamstrings. Yep. <laughs> Your favorite sport apart from squash? I'm Indian, so I have to go with cricket. And since you're a okay. cricketer, I won't disappoint you. <laughs> okay. Your favorite movie? Uh, that's a tough one. It's uh, rapid fire. Bollywood or Hollywood? Anything. Yeah, I'm trying. Bol- bol- anything. Yep. Uh, I'll go with Chuck Day. Yeah. Okay. Your because favorite... it's a sport. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, like, your favorite food? Uh, my favorite food? I like Japanese food a lot. Okay. Your favorite... Okay, it's not a fair, but it's sporting idol. Sporting idol, um, I have a few. Okay. Roger Federer, Usain Bolt, and Sachin Tendulkar. Okay. The last one, describe Ramit Tendulkar. Well. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, like Tony. Okay. So, like, the last question is, like, describe Ramit Tendulkar in just three or four words. Uh, that's actually very hard. No one asked me this before. <laughs> I mean... I would say fun, crazy, okay. uh, and a little lost okay. in my own world. Like okay. Three words, fun, crazy, lost. Okay. So like, we are done with this, you know, like, let's get into the third session. It's going to be like the last question that I want to ask you to before this end of this podcast. The question is your top three advice or tips to someone listening to this who want to start up and uh, move on and take forward their career in squash. Uh, three or you said yeah top like three, yeah top three to people. yep uh, top three would be do it if you want to do it if you love it uh, don't do it because someone is telling you to do it or just because your friend does it so it has to come from within it has to come from you that's the first one the second one would be uh, uh, if you do do it then don't listen to people around okay. you you know there's a lot of noise noise around around you there'll be people um i mean since you heard my ted there was there was a, yeah. a part where i said people most often tell you what you can't do then tell you what you can that that's, that's law true, that's of true. human being i would say but even i do the same thing though i said it even if if there's something someone can't do i'll be like well i don't think you can do this uh that's how we are i think wired so so i would say like if you if you choose some sport and you want to give it your best then give it your best you will have people questioning it. You will have people telling you why you should not do it, why you can't do it. So you've got to ignore all of that. And the third thing I would say, gratitude should be an attitude. Okay. Uh, so, of course, when you do something like that, there are a lot of people around you who support you, uh, who kind of make your dream their dream, and uh, you should be thankful to them and, and not forget them 
once you've achieved whatever you want to achieve. So I think, yeah, the most important is like throughout the process, you keep smiling and, and, um, and your attitude should be showing gratitude. So, yeah. Okay. That is awesome. I like the third point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, like that was the end. I want to like say like a huge ton of thanks for actually sparing up a time and then coming up to my podcast, the Sports Glory, and sharing your journey with us. Thanks a lot for that. Well, thank you. As I said before, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's late in the night here, but uh, it, it was fun talking and. Uh, and yeah, hopefully I'll see you soon and hopefully your podcast will get bigger and bigger. And then someday, five years down the line, as you asked me earlier in the podcast, <laughs> we will meet up at a bigger and better platform. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot for that. Yeah, let's, so thank let's you for having me and good luck with your, with your cricket. And, yep, yep. Thanks yes, a lot for yeah, that. Yeah. Good luck with everything. Thank you. And yeah, good luck with the tournament Bye-bye. that's coming up in November. All the best for that. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So that's it guys. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast as much as I did. It was amazing to interact with Ramitan on the Squash Star of India. Uh, if you haven't checked out the previous episode, make sure you go and check out on Spotify or Google Podcast or in any of your favorite uh, broadcast apps. I had, a, I had a talk with amazing sports people from like sailing, from psychologists to doctors and so many. I'm putting up the link in the description. Make sure you go check out on Spotify as well as Google Podcast. So signing off until then, limelight Irish.